this is Kay Mack, and today we are going to talk about um, one of, you know, um, just like a, a an illustrator that I have, feel like I have spent so much time with, like more time with this guy than like people in my own life, <laughs> or like like family members. Like I feel like I've, I've spent more time with him than like, say my grandma who lived out of state. Um, and his name is Sergio Ar Aragones. Ar Aragones? Aragones? I don't know. It's Spanish. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> and uh, so the reason that I spent so much time with him is because he was an illustrator for Mad Magazine. And uh, and we're going to get into like just how prolific, prolifically he was. Um, yeah. So... Let's start, let's see, what should we start with? Um, so he was born in like the late 1930s in Spain. And the late 1930s was not an easy time to be in Spain. Uh, you know, this was right at the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, um, which I truthfully don't know a ton about. Um, I know a lot more about like American history than I do about European history. But uh, I do know that um, his family, like, left Spain and went to a French refugee camp. So I, like, looked up, like, where they lived in Spain and, like, you know, like a kind of close by town in France. And uh, it, it's, like, maybe 250 miles away. So, like, his parents, they have this, like, two-year-old child and they have to walk to France to escape the Civil War. And uh, so you're like, great, we're out of Spain. Like, we're away from the Civil War. Um, and then France is like, you know, truthfully, we don't really want you guys here. Uh, we don't love the fact that this Spanish Civil War has, like, made it that half a million Spanish people have come to France. They don't speak French. Like, they don't, like, what jobs are you going to do? Like, um, we don't, we you know, we don't love it. And also, uh, <laughs> the early 1940s is not a great time to be in Europe because World War II is really picking up steam. So uh, Sergio and his family um, moved to Mexico because Mexico was like, yeah, we'll take them. We yeah, great. Why not? Um, and Mexico was probably a lot safer place to be than France in World War II. Um, so Sergio, he, he says, uh, and all of this is like from the Wikipedia article, so you should honestly just read that instead of like listening to me talk. Um, no, don't stay, stay. It's funnier when I tell it. It'll be even less accurate. <laughs> um, so he moves to Mexico when they're six. So he he like lives in a refugee camp for like four years when he's like a young young child. Um, and so they move to Mexico, and he's like, here's the deal. Uh, all the other kids made fun of me because I had an accent because I was from Spain. I didn't have any friends. So I would just draw all the time. Like his parents like left him alone in a room with a bunch of crayons and he just like drew all over the wall. And he also tells the story about how uh, they had to do like drawing projects for school. Like they had to do like worksheets and like you had to draw the thing that you were interested in. Um, and he would that was the part that he liked the best and and other kids didn't like it so they would pay him like in pennies to uh to do the drawings for them and he's like yeah this is probably why i'm so fast at drawing because i just like you know that's how i made my bread when i was in elementary school uh, and he just never stopped like he just never stopped drawing he like drew all the time and he would like draw little comics for his friends and like of his teachers and at school and um you know, he eventually, like, I think his friend, like, submitted, like, a, a drawing for a magazine, and he made his first sale at 17, um, and he went to college, and he was just, like, producing, okay, what's that, what's that shape right there? Is that his hand? I don't know. I guess it's not that important. Um, so yeah, so he goes to college, and he, um, is studying architecture, and he, he's still, like, just prolifically drawing comics. And 
uh, eventually he, he like drops out of college because he's like, listen, the only thing I ever want to do in life is draw comics. Like, that's it. That's all I want to do. I draw all the time. Like, it makes sense. Um, so before, before we get to what he does after college, I, I think it's also worth pointing out that one of the things that he studies in college is pantomime or mimery. And so he performs for money with a mime group. And I think that is something like I want to come back to later. Like, so just put a pin in that. We're going to come back to the fact uh, that he was a mime. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm getting like a little pop-up notice. Uh, viewers will experience buffering. Oh, that's fine. No one's watching this. <laughs> um, it's fine. Okay, so he so he uh, he drops out of college and he's like, I I want to be a cartoonist and and he wants to go to New York. So he like does the the classic thing where he like comes to New York City. He's got twenty dollars in his pocket and he's got a portfolio, uh, and he makes his money by like playing a guitar outside of cafes. And uh, people keep telling him it's like you need to submit your art to Mad Magazine, and he's like, oh geez, I don't know, like my work it doesn't really seem to um fit mad magazine uh i don't it's not satire i don't have any articles i don't speak english um but he he gives it a go anyway it's like so never let it be said like don't don't let the, the fact that you think you can't do it stop you from doing something because uh maybe you can do it um i mean if you're sergio Ar Ar aragonis aragonis sorry sergio we're just gonna call him sergio if you're sergio like you know, it's fine. Like, you can do it. Uh, so he gets to Mad Magazine and to, like, the offices of Mad Magazine. Because that that's, like, apparently something you could do. And um, there's another guy there who speaks Spanish. And he's Cuban. Uh, I can't remember his name at the moment. But I, I want to do something on him eventually. Because uh, he did Spy vs. Spy. Which is also, like, a kind of a wordless thing and I, I mean as a kid I love spy versus spy uh, maybe because it was wordless um, you didn't have to understand like the the joke was really clear uh, you didn't have to understand pop culture you didn't have to like watch the TV show that it was about like like you could just like watch it also I don't know what like all this business is right here um, but that's okay so anyway he, he gets there and he's like, okay, this is going to be great. I'm, there's this other guy. He speaks Spanish. Um, he's going to help me, like, get into Mad Magazine. And then it, it turns out that that was, like, a really bad idea. Because the guy who did Spy vs. Spy, like, spoke even less English than Sergio. And, and so he, like, introduces him to the editors at Mad, Mad Magazine. And, and he's like, yes, this is my brother, Sergio. And so they thought he was, like, literally that guy's brother. Um... Anyway, so they like they take a look at his portfolio. They're like, okay, yeah, we'll buy some cartoons, um, and and so they do. And they're like, yeah, maybe you could do like another thing on motorcycles. I don't know if you have time. So like he goes home and he like draws an entire article on um, magazines. And so like the rest they say is history. He like is in every mad magazine from that point on and the only time he ever like misses an issue is because he's like traveling in europe and the the post office lost his mail um he and he and what they say is like he draws really fast like he's a really fast drawer um and he'll send them like he's i guess they said that he'll send them like 40 pages of of comics and, and he'll let them pick and he and he does this great interview where he's like um, I never reuse anything that, that they don't pick. I just keep coming up with new jokes. Um, and so that is Sergio. I mean, he's just, like, incredible. Uh, and so one of the things that he's really famous for in Mad Magazine is that he's, uh, like, he does something like mad, go mad going to the movies. That's, like, what this spread is about. Or it's, like, a, oh, yeah, a mad going to the movies, a look at. Like, he always does this, like, a look at thing. Um, and he also does these margin illustrations, which I don't have. But, you know, so in every Mad Magazine, like, he's got the look of, he's got the, like, uh, he's got the the little margin magazines. And the only person who's been in more episodes is Al Jaffe. Um, also, I, like, I don't know how he does that texture. We're going to come back to it. I'm not chickening out. I am chickening out. We'll come back. <laughs> um, 
I read that he uses a fountain pen for his work, and he uses a technical pen, which is why I'm using uh, Rob's tech pen. I modified it so it has like a like a more more stability because I'm not as good. <laughs> uh, anyway, so he just like he does these gags, um, and they're always just sort of comic. Like, like comic strips and, and the reason that like as a kid that I liked them so much and the same reason that I liked um, Spy vs. Spy so much is because they're really easy to, to parse and to understand the joke um, and that wasn't always the case with everything in Mad Magazine like a, a lot of Mad Magazine was uh, parodies of TV shows and it was like either I, I hadn't watched the TV show or like the, the um, like it just like felt like way too dense like just like it was just so much to read and I liked reading but it was just like I don't I didn't get the jokes um, so I really I mean I really appreciated his work I remember there was a time like where my mom was like maybe recording something like like with a tape recorder and I had to be quiet so I would um, open to a page of Mad Magazine that had his art on it and I would just like know that I had to be quiet and I couldn't turn a page but I would turn it to a page of, of Sergio's work because he was just so funny and like the the drawings were so detailed uh, and and I recognize now as an adult um, or as someone that's like attempted to write and attempted to write jokes and comedy is that uh, like he's just a master of the of the um form of a joke uh, I guess if that makes sense like he knows like every panel he writes is is a joke that is is just so well structured and I think part of it is um, they're all wordless uh, and part of it is that he is and I, I think maybe part of it comes from the pantomime like I honestly think like just knowing like like how to express things with bodies and, and, and without words and like um, performing live pantomime on the weekends like he, he knew he knew what made people laugh uh, he said in, in an interview that when he would do like a mad look at something he would do a ton of research like just like a ton a ton of research he would talk to people he would go places he would look at photos like like he worked really hard on these jokes uh, and, and you you wouldn't be able to tell like they seem effortless um, and one other thing that I, I thought was interesting is that he never penciled anything like he didn't have any pencils he just had um, ink like he just used he just went straight to ink because he, he thought that his drawings would sort of lose their vitality if he um, if if he was a you know, if he had to go over them again, I guess. Um, so I do want to talk about the structure of the jokes, but I realize that I've left out a lot of like his, his biography. And he's still living today. Like, he's still with us. Um, unlike so many of the people that I have featured on this series. Um, he's not dead. <laughs> uh, yet. Um, so he, he like moves to America. And, and, you know, you would think that like being in every issue of Mad Magazine would be enough and he like wins like every illustrator's award that's ever been uh, and something else that he does is a comic book called Gru and it's like a parody of uh, Conan the Barbarian and, and, it, and it's meant to be hilarious and, and the thing that I found so interesting about Gru which is something that I hadn't like ever read before I like looked was like researching for this this episode is that uh, he like went to to comic like comic publishers of the time and was like, hey man, I'm a really fast drawer and I'm really amazing at it and I'm basically a living legend. So what's up? Do you want me to work for you? And they were like, yeah. Oh, dude, we totally want that. Uh, that would be awesome. Here's the thing: we're gonna pay you per page, and if you like create this character named Gru, like we'll pay you per page, but we're not gonna give you. Like, that's just, like, that's not how we do things. Uh, and he was like, okay, cool. Well, no thanks. I don't, I don't really want, I don't want to then. And uh, the, 
he thought it was really important to keep the copyright to his characters and and I think that that's really smart and also like not something that every artist is able to do uh, like if you're desperate I think and you really want to break into the industry I think you'd be like okay I'll take this this flat rate per page but I, I am really impressed that he like kept the the intellectual property rights to his work he probably made a lot more money that way and it, it probably helps that he's like a genius uh, and his stuff was good but I do find it so interesting that he wasn't like he was someone who sold his his artwork like he's he sold illustrations to Matt but with Gru he just wasn't willing and Gru like then went to be like one of the best selling like you know you know best selling of all time or like just a really like it just sold gazillions of copies and he just keeps drawing like and if I made like a gazillion dollars like I'd be like yeah forget it I'm not working anymore I'm just gonna go buy a beach house and like surf all day <laughs> I've never been surfing in my life but in my mind that's what I do if I had a lot of money um so there's one <laughs> there's one other story about him that I just I'm sort of like oh what um is that so I guess his dad was a movie director so it's not he wasn't like like uh like completely out of the world of entertainment and he was like a maybe a guest star on a show like I don't think it was his dad directing it but just like maybe that I, I don't even think his dad directing it was anything related to it and there was like this famous English star I can't remember the guy's name and like Sergio thought it would be really funny to like dress up as a cop in Mexico for some reason and like like I, I can't remember because I thought it was in the Wikipedia article and I was like rereading it before I did this and, and it wasn't there, the story. So I'm just like, I read this like story like three weeks ago, but it's like funny enough that I'm like, yeah, even if I'm telling it badly, it doesn't matter. Um, and so he like jumps out of a bush and like scares the guy. And then later that night, the guy has a heart attack and dies. And uh, like Sergio would like brag he's like yeah I killed that guy <laughs> it's like Sergio like this that's horrible that um like even though it's not like a direct killing it's like hey man maybe don't brag about killing a guy <laughs> um yeah so and I'm, I'm like laughing ha 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 he killed a guy uh cause you know stress kills and if you like totally stress someone out that that could kill someone uh I just don't know if I'd be like, yeah, this is a funny story about that time I killed a guy. <laughs> um, anyway. So let's talk about now the structure of the jokes and, and why he's... Like, I think why his work is so brilliant and it, and it works so well. Um, so let's take a look at this panel. So it's like... I think like a good structure of, of any joke follows a few key factors so it's like one the setup like you have a character in a situation and so in this case uh, the main character is this guy in the black sweater and the you and he is in the front of the line for a movie so like that's the situation you have a setup um, and so like here's another setup where it's like you have a guy and a girl and uh, he has his arm on her shoulder and she like he puts his arm on her shoulder and they're at the movie so it's like there's a setup Here's a setup. You have a guy and he's looking for a movie seat. Like, so any setup for a joke, it starts out with like sort of a common everyday scenario or just like a scenario that people are familiar with. And in like where things go next is that that situation develops in an expected way. So here we have the guy, he's first in line. Now he's gotten the movie seat that he's looking for. He's like, you're like, oh, that is that is a development of this situation. And it's the same here. It's a guy and a gal. It's a development. He puts his hand over her shoulder. Um, this guy sees the empty seat. He, like, goes through the line. He gets in the seat. Um, here's this one. We have, like, we have a guy. He's suspicious of, like, kids in a trench coat. Um you would see, oh yeah, it would be very obvious that they would be exposed. Like, so this is like a setup, a natural development of that setup. Um, this guy, he, and so this one's a little bit different, so we'll come back to that one. Uh, here we go. 
a setup, two guys, uh, they see two dames at a movie, they want to go sit by them. Like, this all is like normal stuff. And so then the punchline takes that setup, natural development, and then gives it a humorous or ironic twist. You know, it's like you would think this guy, um, being first in line for a movie, he, would, he gets the seat that he wants, but in the end, the person sitting in front of him is gonna block his view of the movie. So it's like all of his work is for nothing. Like, so that's the joke, like that's the payoff. It's like, here's an unexpected development that takes the situation um, and adds a humorous twist. So it's like the same with these guys. So we've got the lady, arm on her shoulder. She expects that it's a romance. Oh, actually it's funny, he just wanted her popcorn set up two guys oh like we're gonna go sit by some girls actually it turns out that they're hippies with long hair and these guys are like it's a it's a subversion of the expectation in a good way uh not in a game of thrones season eight kind of way um so then the kids with the trench coat um you know it's like oh yeah you see the men getting called out but then you learn it was the plan all along and all the boys get to go see a dirty movie this one's more like classic physical comedy, so it's like, here's a normal situation. You're leaving the movie theater at the end of the show. You slip on things on the floor. Isn't it funny? This is just like a visual gag. It's like, now you're like showing up with stuff. So it's like, it's that really classic, oh yeah, here's this one. So the guy, he sees an empty seat. He moves to take the seat. It turns out a really short man was sitting in the seat and now everyone's mad at him like so it's funny it's like that's not what you expect it's like a twist it's a surprise for the audience because you would expect under normal circumstances someone seeing an empty seat they go and try to sit in the seat you would expect that they would then sit in the seat but the surprise is that there is already somebody sitting there um, and like all of his gags are like this and so he said that like he would he would always like the structure is is usually really similar it's um you know just sort of that three or four pan two three or four panel setup a situation an expectation for how it's going to turn out um a way that it turns out that's different than what you expected that's funny um and you know it's sort of like when he says it's like oh i don't do um i don't reuse it's like he might use the same joke structure like it might be um you know, oh, it wasn't what I expected, or, like, it's I ironic, like, everything I did to bring about the outcome actually, you know, gives me the opposite outcome, which is, like, this one with the movie, um, thing, but, you know, so the form is really similar, but the, like, illustrations and the trappings change, but they're all f funny, like, I was, when I was, like, researching, like, all of the, like, I mean, it's just, like, oh my gosh, I, like, even now, like, like years later it's still a great read like it's it's like it's like the setups are so classic and and uh you know it's like some of the things where it's like a mad look at nuclear war where it's just sort of like geez these were for like 13 year old boys um but you know it's like the the subjects might be a little dated like a mad look at submarines or like a mad look at you know whatever you know it's like he was in a gazillion issues there's gonna be a lot of mad looks at um, a mad look at gardening, a mad look at marriage, a mad look at the office, like, like, those parts might be dated, but the jokes themselves are still funny. Like, it, like, just because he is so good at the setup and the payoff and, like, just the physicality of, like, the characters, and because it's, there aren't words, I think it works really well. I don't know, I'm just, like, I'm, like, reading it now, like, knowing more about, like, the structure of jokes and, like, joke writing, I'm just like, man, he's, like, He's really good. Um, he's just really good. Uh, there is one thing that, like, reading this that, or, or you know, and this panel in particular, that uh, I did kind of want to talk about a little bit, and, and I'm always, like, struggling to phrase things when I'm, like, gonna say things that are not controversial, but just, like, maybe it is controversial. Uh, but I guess it's it's something that I think about as, as someone who creates works. Uh, not that anyone reads them, watches them, looks at them. But uh, it's, it is something that I think about. It's like, who 
who is the butt of the joke? Like, who... Like, why is it funny? Why is it funny? Like, why is this joke funny? Um, this thing where it's like, I want a really great seat to see the movie, so I get there early, stand first in line. I get the seat. What is it about this person right here that makes his seat, like, that gives him this expression on his face? Like, why does a big fat woman, why is that not a good idea? Like, why, why is that funny? And it's because, oh, she's going to block the screen. You don't want a big fat woman to sit in front of you because you won't be able to see the movie. Um, and it's sort of like, is the, like, that means a big fat woman's body is a joke. Um, and I have been a fat woman in my life. I'm not a fat woman right now. Uh, and, and I really don't want this to come across as like, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's like, he's horrible for making this joke. Or like, no one should ever make jokes like this. Or like, 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 like imply that this is some sort of big deal. But, uh. It is one thing about Mad Magazine, it's like if you look at, you know, sort of this, like this ex, this woman in the X-rated poster is like a really typical woman that, that Sergio would draw, sort of like um, big old titties and like a, a real tiny waist, uh, long legs, and this is like a sexy woman that you want to go see a movie about, and then this is a, a fat woman that you don't want to sit in front of you. And, and the thing is, is that you could make this same joke, like this panel, uh, and you could tell the same joke, and it doesn't have to be with a person that looks like this. Uh, it could be a person wearing a really tall hat. It could be a basketball player. There could be a lot of people that fit this um, space uh, that, that fill the same function. Um, and again, I don't, I don't want it to be like this. He was wrong to tell the joke this way, but the, the only thing that I can say is like that, as a young girl who was reading it, that that was fat. Uh, you learn pretty quickly that your body is a joke. Um, that your body is a joke. Your body is a punchline. Um, and and this isn't just something that I think that fat women experience. I think there are a lot of people. Uh, whose bodies become jokes in, in stuff like this and, and Mad Magazine being like targeted as it was towards teenage boys um, or preteen boys uh, it, it's like a fat woman is an easy target because it's like oh yeah we like women who are sexy like in the x-rated thing and so it makes sense like, like I get it but uh thing is is that it's not just this comic it was a lot of comics like growing up like fat women were jokes um if you ever saw the show uh talk soup with joel McHale, um like half of his jokes about women were just that they were fat like that that they were fat like that was the joke and it was just something that you saw a lot. And, and you internalize that in a way. If you're like seeing it everywhere, you're like, oh, I, I guess I get it. Like, my body is disgusting. Like, people think it's a joke. They don't want to sit by you. They don't want to like, um, you know, they don't want to look like you are not a person they want to be near. And uh, so I just think it's like, it it makes sense to be really careful. Like, who who are you making the butt of your joke? And like, are they someone that is already the butt of a lot of jokes? Um, and you might be like, oh yeah, they deserve to be that joke. Like, it is gross. Like, you don't want a big fat person to sit in front of you. Like, it, it's like, um, but I don't know. It's just like, I feel like I wouldn't want to make that joke. I guess that's all I can say. I'm not saying that joke is wrong. I'm not saying don't make that joke. I'm not saying he was wrong for making that joke. I can only say, like, what effect those kind of jokes had on me. Um, and, yeah, and that's all. I guess that's all. That's my that's my soapbox uh, for the night. <laughs> um, I was like, if you had a similar experience, make a, make a comment. Let me know. Um, because I know it's, it's there's a lot of people who have that experience and there's a lot of jokes 
where it's not just fat ladies. Other people like experience that too. But I also don't want to like name anybody because I don't don't want to be like nobody say it and they'll be like, wait, how could you even think people would joke about me? It doesn't stop these all from being hilarious. And it doesn't stop this strip from being hilarious. Um, I just do remember, like... So I used to watch soap operas in middle school. And uh, there was this this character on Days of Our Lives. And she was fat. And it was, like, the first time I could remember seeing a fat woman as, like, a... A romantic partner to someone and it wasn't a joke and I, and I just couldn't believe it I was like oh wait he, she has this husband and he seems to really love her and he kisses her and it's it just like it it blew my mind because I'd never seen that before um, maybe it existed and I just didn't know but I mean she was treated like every other lady character on the show I mean she was an evil character but you know can't can't win them all I don't know. I still, I mean, I know I said all that, but I still love. These are so funny. I, it makes me want to read Gru. I never read it, so it was supposed to be like, I guess Conan the Barbarian was really popular. Uh, so it was like a parody of that, and Gru's a character that just like is always like sort of comedically messing up all the time. Uh, which I think is funny. Also, I think it's funny like these, these, uh, like he's really good at just drawing tons of details. Like, can you imagine just drawing all these people? <laughs> like, he really, he wasn't phoning it in at all. Like, all these people in the theater. And the fact that he didn't do, draw it in pencil, maybe that, like, I don't know, maybe that does it? Or does part of it? Um, hard to say. Hard to say. Uh, it is interesting, like, uh, I feel like I've gotten pretty far. Like, I guess I'm still scarred by, uh, the Franklin Booth one where I, I like got like one half of one stump of one tree uh, his work was just so good and so like intensive but I feel like if you were like maybe drawing all the time like like I wonder how long this took him it's funny he's so prolific and I'm like do I have anything else to say about him I don't know maybe I'll end the stream early I usually try and go for like 45 minutes I've gone for about half an hour um I feel like anything else I would say in the stream would just be like go look up his work like study it um it's so good sign up for a pantomime class <laughs> like do those even exist professional mime mimery classes uh it is funny I know someone who like draws comics and and uh and posts them and uh like I think like his partner told me that like he doesn't read other comics because he doesn't want to um, like unintentionally like be influenced by other people's jokes or ideas and I'm like oh man I don't know that's just like a really different strategy than me and like I get it because you want to like be original and you don't want to like sort of unintentionally copy somebody uh, you know, it's like sort of like the nightmare is like retelling someone's gag and like not even being aware of it. But I don't know, like, like I feel like there's there's a hundred ways you could tell this gag, like this like someone takes measures to like um, like get there first. Uh, they get what they want. Oh, it turns out they don't. So this could be even like, um, yeah. Ugh, boy, putting it on the spot. So it's like, say you, like... Hmm. Okay, say, say you want to, like, get up early to see the sunrise. And so you park your car and you, like... Uh, you, you park your car in the parking lot, um, like, when it's still dark outside. And then in the second panel, you could take a nap. And like because you're waiting for the sun to rise and then in the third panel when you wake up to see the sunrise uh, like there's a bunch of cars parked in front of you and, and you can't see it anymore or you know something like that <laughs> although I don't, I don't know why exactly you wouldn't be able to see the sunrise I'm still workshopping it <laughs> um, but it's just sort of like that repetitive like that 
setup, development, unexpected um, outcome or ironic outcome. Like, and boy, it's always hard to know if you're using the word irony correctly. It's hard to tell what that is right there. Like these shapes. Like this is his hand, but I don't know what like these shapes are. I think it's because I just it's not high enough resolution image. Um, this was probably fun to draw. Just like like there's like all of these characters have like something going on. It's like oh we're all looking for seeds. Like like these people holding hands. Like um, talking in the in the corner. It's like how fun to like just like think of all this stuff and like like draw it all. I'm always like, oh, I feel bad, like, like I am drawing a lot these days, like, but I'm not, you know, like, you read about someone like Sergio and you're like, oh, geez, if I really wanted to be really good, like, I would have to, like, I, I just, I'm not putting in that level of effort. Um, so I don't know, it's like, I don't know if there are people that put in that, that level of effort and still suck. <laughs> like, that's the fear, is that you're like, oh, good, I'm just, like, still drawing, like, horrible looking people. Um, I'm working a lot on drawing anatomy. Uh, so I'm like doing a lot of life drawing, um, drawing the, the nude figure. And uh, like, I don't know, stuff like this is good to remind myself that uh, you, you don't have to like draw a perfectly proportioned person that, that looks like a real person because, you know, these gags work with just, you know, sort of these really cartoony simplified forms and they work really well. You don't have to, you know, have perfect drawings to be funny. It's, it's in some ways the story is more important. The joke is more important than the art. The art is part of it um, because he has like these, this really characteristic style, but um, especially the small art, but like the story you're telling with the art is the most important part. Um, because that's the part people re will remember. This, even if these jokes were drawn with like the most beautiful, like realistic um, movie interiors ever, but if they weren't funny or they weren't like that sort of like standard joke format, nobody would care. Like no, nobody would remember, or like they wouldn't have have kept him hired for like every single ep issue of Mad Magazine that ever was. Um, also, did anybody else? I mean, you. I mean, if you ever read Mad Magazine, you must have noticed. But it got so bad at the end, like, it just was like a hollow shell of itself. I'm, and I'm not quite sure I understand what happened. Um, maybe it's just like magazines don't sell like they used to. Comp, like they just didn't like understand like what made these things so popular. Like, there's only one Sergio Argiones like per generation. And we were lucky enough to get him in Mad Magazine, but um, I think now, like, if you wanted to start something like that, I just think about, like, would you look on social media, look for people that are just producing every day, like, can you teach someone to make jokes like this, be this obsessed, like, I'm, I'm just impressed that they found all these people to work for Mad Magazine, um, and that, that it was just such, like, it just seems like they got, like, like everybody who was amazing uh, to be in it. And the, I guess so I read that the only person who was in more issues was Al Jaffe. Did I say that already? I think I did because I already was like, wait, is that how his name is pronounced? Uh -huh. In my head, not out loud. Uh, and he was the one that drew the like, the fold in back covers. And, and a lot of other stuff too. I was like looking him up to be like, oh yeah, who was that guy? And, and like, I was like, oh, I don't really remember him as well. Uh, he didn't have like these easy jokes that Sergio had. Uh, although maybe if I read them again, I might have a greater appreciation for them. That's kind of the hard stuff with satire sometimes is that, or not sometimes, all the time is that satire has like a shelf life. Like if you're going to do, um, a satire of say Columbo uh, which which was a TV cop show uh, you know it only works as long as people have watched Columbo uh, and once Columbo goes off the air like the satire sort of loses 
its power, like, unless you've seen the show. So it's like, with Sergio's work, it's like, it's going to work for everybody for a really long time. Satire is going to work for, for that day. Like, and there's not, it's not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just, uh, if you are a satire artist, like, get paid. <laughs> get paid up front, because uh, it's not going to go forever. The jokes aren't always going to be funny. I think about that. There was a show, Murphy Brown, and I, I was trying to use that as an example of satire that doesn't necessarily age well, because it's like, who remembers all the like intricacies of the Reagan administration to remember why that joke is funny? And as I was saying it, like the person I was saying it to was like, what's Murphy Brown? And I'm like, oh no, oh no, now I'm old. Now I'm talking to people who've never watched Murphy Brown. Um, which I guess is fine, because like, why would you watch it now? It's hard to get the jokes. Um, it was, but it was a workplace comedy, it had Candace Bergen. Um, it was funny, and it was supposed to be like this big thing where she's like, I guess she was just like, I don't know, she was a single mom on the show, like, by choice, and, and like, I guess maybe Reagan made fun of her, or politicians did, I don't know, actually, <laughs> I really, really shouldn't just say that kind of stuff, because I have no idea, let's see, let's take a look, so I've been going for about 40 minutes, and like, I've been able to get quite a lot done, um, yeah, it's funny, like, these people are not, like, their faces are not, like, like this lady. Like, these are quick drawings, but, um, they're just so charming. There's just so much detail and so much fun stuff to look at. Uh, it was a really, it was a real treat to, like, go back and look at his work and to realize that he was just such a, like, such a strong, uh, joke teller and, like, so good at it. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's what I got for Sergio. Uh, it was a pleasure for me. I hope if someone should ever listen to this, it was a pleasure for you. Thank you so much for listening, if you made it this far. Um, because I worked in a marketing agency, I'm contractually obligated to say like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you next time.